Hey everybody, it's Aiden CryptoBurb speaking. Welcome to another episode of The Nest Show Podcast. It's been a while since we had an excellent legend on the show as a great VIP guest. And today's actually no different. We are having a host, an incredible person that I had uh, opportunity and chance to meet some time ago, uh, physically also in, in, in person in Dubai, in UAE. Incredible person, incredibly talented um, trader and beyond that, we are talking about Matthew Dixon, who is an excellent CEO of Evi and first unbiased AI and machine learning crypto ratings platform. This is very interesting. I'm definitely looking forward, uh, as well as the whole audience, to hear uh, to hearing more about Matthew. In a second, he's an excellent uh, professional, long-time investor, long-time trading uh, proficient uh, with masters in finance and investment. And uh, there's a whole bunch of stories that we are about to hear from Matthew Dixon himself. How's it going, Matthew? How are you feeling? I'm good. Thank you, Adrian, for that lovely introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, very, very much looking forward to this, uh, this interview today. Excellent. Very good. So please excuse my ramble. English is not my first language. I really wish uh, I, I spoke such a, beautiful, uh, such a beautiful British accent that, that, that you would have up there. Uh, Matthew, that's something that I always, uh, something that I would always look up to and admire. Uh, so, if you were to introduce yourself, or, or more so about your whole background story that's taken you uh, basically here to this very interview uh, and to being in the position of the CEO of Evai, what would that be, Matthew? Yeah, I think it's a passion for investment and being in the industry for such a long time. So, I mean, I've actually been trading since the early 1980s, so it is a long time. We're talking 40 years here. Um, and it's a passion for investment. It wasn't always easy. Um, when you start out with these things, you actually start out losing a lot of money. And if you can work through that and learn from it and have the right personality and emotional, um, you know, kind of setup for it, then you can improve and you can become better and better. And so what I love to do now, I'm really passionate about education about sharing the knowledge that I've built up over years. So um, I do that obviously through eBay um, and the eBay thing, well, I'm sure we'll talk more about it, but that was really brought about and it was inspired by the 2008 financial crisis and the failure of ratings back then. And I wanted to do something to change that, to make it more of a level playing field for everybody to empower traders from the smallest traders right through and that's really what drives me. And that's kind of my background. So I, I did that. I started off in regulated financial services. I've run a regulated fund in London. And, you know, and then I started sometime after that, I got involved in crypto and then in the rating side of things, as I say, to try to empower traders and, and make, uh, make it a, a better environment for people. That makes sense. That is definitely a very brief um, to the point rundown of, of your background story, Matt, and uh, I've been wondering, right, since we had so, so many uh, good discussions with, uh, not only with yourself, Matthew, but also with, with the whole Levi team, I, I would say that it's one of the most interesting concepts to utilize crypto ratings based on unbiased machine learning and, and data-driven approach, utilizing and leveraging all the AI, artificial intelligence. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, it's really about the advances in technology. So as I say, I've been a trader all my life and it's really amazing how things have changed where we used to be, be when you wanted to make a trade, basically you'd phone up and you speak to your broker and you place your trade and it was a very slow process. And I was actually quite good even in the early days and, and I made a lot of money in the early days by predicting what was going to be in the next magazines and so on and made a lot of money. My first fall back was in 1987 and 1987 crash is one of the biggest financial crashes and i lost not only everything i had i lost a whole lot more as well and i had to go to work for a conventional um, bank at the time to make enough money to pay back the debt i'd accumulated from that but i wasn't scared off basically when i recovered from it i got back into trading as soon as i could because i knew there was something there i made a lot of money but i realized i'd made some mistakes and so through the crashes, they're actually one of the sort of benchmarks of my life, the milestones throughout my life. You know, I had the 1987 crash. We had the, um, we had the dot-com boom and bust in 2000. We had the, you know, had various crashes. Then obviously the 2008 financial crash. Then we had the, um, you know, the COVID crash. And every time, there may be different reasons, but there's some common things here that you can learn. 
And the 2008 financial crash, for me, was all about a failure of ratings. And it was basically corruption within the centralized system. And this is what spawned Bitcoin back in the day. So, you know, if you remember the first Bitcoin, I think it was encoded the, um, the headline in the Times in London about the banking, the corruption in banking, et cetera, and the collapse of the financial system. And this is what spawned Bitcoin, decentralization. And so this is what I wanted to do is decentralize, build a decentralized rating system, which doesn't rely on humans who are not only biased, but also very often corrupt, which we, we saw that with a lot of the bankers. So I wanted to build a system that's purely data driven. And with the advances in technology, this became possible because AI has really taken off. It's actually the 1950s it started off. Um, and, then, and then it went sort of cold in the 1970s. And then it's kind of had a reemergence with, I think it was Gary Kasparov, wasn't it? The, um, the chess player. And that was the first time that an AI computer, I think it was Deep Blue, wasn't it? That beat Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion of the day. And that was, um, you know, 25 years or so ago. And from there, you can imagine that was when AI first managed to outdo a human mind, one of the top human minds in one of the very narrow um, fields in playing chess, basically. So the advances that we've seen in computing from that day have made it possible. And that's what we've harnessed with um, eBay. And we're getting more and more powerful because with AI, you know, you've got deep learning and it's like, you know, a child that you the more you teach a child, the more information you give it, if it's got the ability to learn, it will get better and better. And that's what we're seeing with our ratings. And we've got, we're improving the systems as well. So with more and more upgrades, this ratings will just become more and more powerful. And the good thing about it is we're not just giving it to the top institutions. This is available for everybody to use. And we've proven scientifically that it improves your chances that we can beat the market. And it's very, very difficult to beat the market. Most people think, oh, traders can beat the market. It's not that easy. Nearly all the fund managers in the world don't beat the market. They actually underperform the market because they, um, apart from anything else, they've got all the costs and um, commissions and management fees, et cetera, which actually erode what they have. So they're kind of bound by the science of investment. You know, we know about modern portfolio theory, we know about, about efficient market hypothesis, and they're bound by these things. Um, but with the advances in technology and AI, there's some possibilities that really open up to us. And that's what we're doing with eBay. Mm. That incredible uh, breakdown of what, what you're doing with eBay, I think it, that kind of like gives you deeper insight. Um, and I perfectly agree with, with you know, being, being in a world and living in a world of finance when there are so many corrupt people who had to do deal with, with finance in any form of shape, right? Uh, such as politicians, modern monetary policymakers. It's it's always been there. Um, and because of that, there is lots of biases, just like you said, you know, so lots of lots of bank failures actually are out to uh, misrated um, evaluations in a way, right? So it's, it's very important. If you were to compare the ratings per se for cryptocurrencies versus traditional finance, how would cryptocurrencies differ from, from the TradFi? Well, I think what's amazing is it's not so much the asset class because crypto is just another asset class. It's an emerging asset class. So it's actually the technology behind the ratings themselves. So when you have a system and there are many of them out there have basically a panel of human experts who rate a range of assets and that could be cryptocurrencies. As we know, there are about 20 odd thousand cryptocurrencies around at the moment. So it's not possible that a panel of experts can actually rate all these assets and deliver information, action, actionable information to traders in real time. So you need to harness technology. So the traditional rating agencies, they do have panels of experts. Yes, they, they have some data management systems, but in, in general, they have panels of experts who allocate ratings to different assets, but they're not, they don't empower people from a trading perspective. Yes, they can, they can be useful at identifying underlying value, but that's another element of what we're doing within the crypto ratings. We have kind of two elements to it. There's identifying the true underlying value and then there's what we have a trading score, basically, which um, gives you some indication. It has predictive value in terms of future price movements. So this actually empowers you far more than just the um, traditional ratings, which 
I mean, again, we've all had the experience with banks. I mean, a lot of people got into crypto, and I know somebody very close to me who got into crypto, and it's actually, I had this experience as well. I've been in business all my life. When I was do, doing business abroad and I wanted to, for example, engage some developers in, in you know, maybe in Australia or, or America or wherever it might be, uh, to actually do the financial transfer, to, you, you know, you might agree a deal with them, but then you've got to transfer the money and actually to transfer money abroad is quite messy, it's quite expensive and it's quite slow and it can take a lot of time. So the work doesn't start until that money is transferred, but with crypto, we can do it in a moment, in a, in, a, in a second. We can just transfer it. You can actually check the blockchain yourself and see if it's done. So all of these things about crypto being used for, for crime and so on, this is all basically a red herring as far as I'm concerned, because we have the blockchain, we have the technology and the ability to track transactions, to know when transactions have, have taken place. And um, this for me just brings efficiency and, you know, it should really improve business efficiency. We can improve so many aspects of life. I mean, even mortgages, for example, which to to get a mortgage and to do a transaction with buying some real estate takes weeks in the UK, long, long time. But when you've got this sort of blockchain technology, then it can happen almost instantaneously. So it can make business more efficient, the whole world more efficient from a business perspective, so it can improve our lives. And this is what, it's not just about trading and making money, it's about making the world a better place. And so I do think there's so many positives to be had out of crypto. This is what I love about business. I want a business which there are no losers. So with what I'm doing, we're, we're empowering people. Um, so even if we downgrade a cryptocurrency, for example, it can actually be used in a useful way by the crypto. They can look at the factors that have downgraded it and say, okay, perhaps we need to improve here. So we're actually empowering even the cryptos themselves to potentially improve. And we've had this experience where there have been issues with liquidity, which are downgraded to crypto. People say, why is this downgraded? And we look into it and you can look at the individual factors and you can say, okay, it was this particular reason. And we see perhaps in the days later that a, a crypto then has a, an issue with um, with liquidity, for an, exam for an example. So it can be used to benefit people at every level. Hmm. I love I love your take on how transparency can lead to efficiency. I think this is this is something that is an actual game changer, and I perfectly agree and align. Uh, you said something very interesting that caught my that caught my attention a lot, and that was arriving at the true value, right? So deciding about the true value is something very very difficult on average, and luckily for for us from from the trading viewpoint we don't necessarily even we, we are not often given the chance to know what the true value is right it's something that is that is kind of like figured out on the on the go there is no uh, a single authority to tell you okay this is the bitcoin benchmark price that we buy in or sell in right it's something that is self regulated and it's very difficult to capture so how would you say that the, those crypto ratings that you serve at uh, at Evai, uh, would uh, would help you arrive at those true values. How do you how do you find those true values? I mean, it's interesting, and I'm quite happy to say that we are on a journey with the ratings. We're not yet there. It's we'll be constantly evolving and improving, and so that's one element that we are looking at. And it's completely different, as I said, to the trading score, which gives you, which is more based. Trading is actually more based on sentiment and behavioural analysis and things like that, and not about underlying value, because you can actually make profit on, as we know, with meme coins and so on. You can make a profit with um, with no, necessarily no underlying value. So that's not that important. But I think when you're long-term portfolio building and maybe building something towards your retirement, you do want to know a little bit more about, does this have enduring true underlying value? And then you look more at the use case. So this is where, I think this is what determines true underlying value for a cryptocurrency is actually the use case. So it's like with a, with a company, with a business, what do they actually do? What do they make? And what is their business model? And that is the way to look at underlying value, I believe. And so you can, you can think about, you know, obviously Bitcoin um, uh, and Ethereum and various tokens. They're actually, um, the technology that they're, they're advancing and developing has some value that you can attribute. You can put a, you know, you can actually put a, a value on it. You can put a data point to it. Um, and sometimes you can't see these values directly. 
So you look at what's, uh, you know, kind of circumstantial evidence which point to a particular thing. So um, there are many ways to determine the underlying value. We're not completely there yet, but our researchers, we've got an amazing research team and we're partnered with two universities, Brighton University in the UK, Peking University in China, and we've got access to a number of top ranking professors and these people are working on solving these problems. So we have um, a, a ranking system which looks at underlying value, but I can tell you that we're, we're working on some upgrades which are going to make this so much more powerful. So whilst what we have is valuable and will help people, what we'll have in two months time will be better and six months time will be better. And this is part of AI is about learning. And AI can even be used to identify which data you should be gathering, which data has real predictive value and which data can really change the, you know, the outlook and, and, and so on. So um, there's so much potential, as I say, very, very exciting opportunities we have. Mm. Right. Indeed. I, I would perfectly agree there and I'm with you, Matt. Um, so I've been wondering, right? Of, of course, there's a whole bunch of VVA intelligence that, that you that you have access to. And I've been wondering if you can give us a little bit of a rundown on how 2023 differs from 2022 in numbers using the crypto rating study that you have access to. Um, well, we've, I mean, we're, we're advancing so much that things change very rapidly. So the latest, um, testing that we did and one of, we had uh, one of our um, research is uh, research officers is a, um, a basically a professor at Brighton University again he had 15 years practical experience working with Bank of America as their head UK strategist so he's actually done some exhaustive testing of the actual results of what the ratings can do and obviously we've had um, I mean for example just looking at from the Bitcoin peak and the down market we've had since then the bear market since then Bitcoin lost, um, you know, a massive amount of its value over that period of time. I think it lost something like 65% of its value. And over the same period of time through the testing with our, with a permutation of our ratings, and you can use the ratings in various different ways, um, to build different strategies. So under one permutation, we returned plus 45% whilst the market lost or whilst Bitcoin lost 65%. Um, on a risk adjusted basis, we even beat the S&P, we even beat gold. So the important thing is that we're not just making performance by taking additional risk. And this is going back to modern portfolio theory. Normally, the only way you can enhance returns is by taking increased risk. They have basically um, an efficient frontier, which determines there's, there's only such a, you know, only a peak return you can get for a certain uh, level of risk. So what we've done is we've kind of changed the, you know, changed the rules really, that we're actually able to reduce the risk right down. So we have um, a very good sharp ratio on our returns, which means, as I say, that we've outperformed even gold, even the S&P, um, a, a equally weighted basket of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin itself. So this is scientific proof that the ratings work. And, you know, by using the ratings properly, you can make good returns. So obviously you can choose to use the ratings. It's like a tool in your toolbox. I believe it's one of the sharpest tools that you'll be able to use. It's not the only tool and it's not the only thing you'll necessarily use to make your decision. And I'm an active trader, still a very active trader. I've got, you know, I don't want to brag about it, but I've got a really, really good track record um, of positive returns. And I use the ratings as one of those tools but everybody needs to do their own, have their own systems. And for me, if we can make that a little bit simpler for people to make returns, then we're doing a good job. That's okay. That I'll, I'll take it. As a, I'll take it as a very good answer. Um, I've been wondering again, like if you, of, of course, have again access to the whole bunch of EVA intelligence. In terms of the ratings. Are you, are you able to tell how the ratings are slightly shifting dynam dynamically as we're entering the, let's say, slower summer? How would the, how the rating change potentially, uh, you know, for, for crypto, for Bitcoin, let's say, uh, for quarter, quarter one, as it was very powerful, let's say, as we head into the summer? Well, the good thing is, you see, we, we gather data, various data points. There are many different factors and we're adding more and more factors to it, which take into account 
the economic backdrop. So most people tend used to think that crypto was some kind of magic asset that didn't perform, you know, that wasn't, you know, in, influenced by economic indicators. We saw that wasn't right last night when we, you know, for example, when they, the interest rate decision, which was on hold, but then the outlook is very, very hawkish by the Fed. And so that hawkish outlook caused a real dump in price late last night. Um, and so cryptocurrency is a risk asset. It performs like a risk asset. It's more volatile than most because it's an emerging risk asset. So when you've got your rating system, it's very important that we take into account, obviously behavioral analysis is important. You need to take into account sentiment. Um, sentiment is very, very important. But one thing that a lot of um, people don't take into account is the economic backdrop and particularly US because, you know, these cryptos are valued usually against US dollar. And so when we're seeing, usually when we see dollar appreciation, we see crypto in inverse correlation moving down. That's not always the case, but it's, you know, there's, there's certainly a correlation there. But that's why you don't use just one indicator. That's why it's important to have a blend of indicators. And then the AI actually determines which at that point in time is going to be the most important factor so that's the point of having this dy dynamic evolutionary system, which can learn. And actually it learns by the changes in circumstances. So as you rightly say, when you're in a bear market, um, um, you know, the, these indicators might have a different impact than if you're in a bull market. Um, and so the AI can actually take advantage of these things and perform differently under different circumstances. Whereas the human mind, we tend to follow very much a kind of um, patterns, as it were, we, you know, when we look at charts, the human mind just looks at patterns and we're bound by, you know, emotions of fear and greed and things like this. Whereas when you have a, a computer system, an AI driven system, it's not bound or it's not shackled by these things. It can actually be free to make the right decision based on different information that comes in, in different times, like the bear market, the bull market, um, when interest rates change, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. That is actually actually the very essence of, of a profitable trading approach, right? I mean, as a technical trader myself, as a trader market technician, you know, what I've learned on my very short period of uh, period of career, you know, compared to such an incredible track record that you have, Matt, I would say that the most relevant lesson that I learned eventually is that it all leads to systematic approach, that you have to have those uh, repetitive uh, set of framework this this is set of rules guidelines that you need to follow even rules more more than guidelines that you need to follow regardless of whatever uh well opinion we have at the, the given time uh and, and point so um j just like you said you know following those ratings can provide predictive value in a way can be source of informative um knowledge for trading right so if we know that we can use something for trading and it can provide better choice, better accuracy, better information. Well, that isn't that something that we should always take, right? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, whatever you're doing, you use the tools that you have available. And as I say, I, I think there are a number of tools out there. I still don't, I don't just rely on the ratings. I think it's important. It's like a filter for me. I'll actually still do my own research, etc. And then I'll look at the ratings and it might actually be the tipping point as to whether I take a trade or not because it can actually take into account a lot more factors and indicators. And, um, and as I say, even behavioral analysis is quite important because we're unable to dissociate ourselves from these, these emotions really of fear and greed. The best traders are the least emotional usually, because once you get emotional, you are swung by the markets, you move with the markets. And they say, you know, the famous saying, the markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. Um, so they, they tend to, to us, they seem to be irrational. And that's because we like to, as humans, we like to try to understand. And as I say, we like to, we recognize patterns very, very well. And we like to follow rules um, to some extent. But then the emotion often throws us off from following those rules. So there's lots of different lessons we can learn. I mean, I, I like to keep my trading simple. There's a lot of indicators out there. I mean, there's a lot that really don't have predictive value, and yet we rely on them. It's almost like there's a conspiracy out there because you have all these books, you have so many trading programs out there that teach you things which genuinely have no predictive value. And this is actually what a lot of my 
um, education, my, when I did my master's degree, this is what I focused on, what actually affects prices and what doesn't. And it's just as important to know what doesn't affect prices as to what does. Because when we're using indicators that don't actually predict prices, we're just basically, you know, it's, it's like putting a fog in the way that you really can't see what you're doing. So that's, uh, that, that's Perfect my Perfect take. Perfect take, Mike. Um, that actually takes me to the next question, right? And this may sound like a little bit like a more academic dispute, you know, fault-provoking, again, statement. Um, I'd love to take your brain, Matt, and, and, and understand better along with the audience. How does AI help with portfolio efficiency? Is it helpful for achieving, attain, and retaining the portfolio efficiency? Well, definitely AI can maximize any combination of, uh, you see a human mind, as I said, we've already said, we can't handle that amount of data in one go. It was 25 years ago, we, you know, AI managed to beat the top chess guy. We're 25 years on, we know the advances and how quickly computing power doubles and doubles and doubles. So we're so much more powerful now. So it can give you the optimal performance for the data that's available. We can't do that with the human mind. So you need to use AI. 2023 is the year of AI. You know, everybody says 2023 is the year of AI. It, potentially, um, you know, some people see it as being a danger, but I think we do need to harness it because there are certainly a lot of advantages to be had out of AI. And in terms of looking at, you know, for example, efficient market hypothesis was one of the big areas of my study. My whole dissertation was basically um, on the efficient market hypothesis, which states, you know, there are three levels of efficiency and, the, the theory is that the technical analysis has no predictive value. And this theory has been tested over and over again over many, many years. And we've got many books that have been written about it that traditional technical analysis does not have predictive value. And this is why you look at the percentage of people in the industry, especially retail people who lose money, it's, about, it's actually about 98%. You hear figures, all sorts of figures, but it's close to 98%. Nearly everybody loses. So there is a way to make money and you don't have to be just the, the house, you know, as it were, you know, with gambling, you have the house and the house always wins. And so when you're trading, you're trading against market makers, you're trading against institutions. They can see your trading positions. They can see your leverage. They can see your stop losses. It's like you're playing poker with them and they can see your hand and you're trying to beat them. It's impossible almost to trade against these institutions unless you have the power of AI and, and knowing a little bit about the way these institutions work. So, um, you know, I do think that, well, I do know that efficient market hypothesis, my belief is I've done all the research, the indicators, even listening to news coming out, you don't know from the news that comes out how it's going to affect the market and with what delay it's going to affect the market. So you can't even listen to news coming out of the market to impact your trading unless you have an AI system which can combine all of the data and can give a much better prediction on how it's going to affect the price of an asset. So AI is actually the, is, is a game changer now. If you don't have it, um, I mean, I can still, I still use you know, the lessons I've learned over 40 years and I believe I, I am still consistent, still make money, but AI, the AI systems just give you that little bit of an edge. And um, if you've got a tool, you might as well use it, especially if, if you're not being charged the earth for it. So we're making this available to the retail community at a reasonable price. It's not something that's um, you know, exclusive in terms of price. That makes sense. I've been I've been really caught up, uh, you know, by 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 the por again portfolio efficiency in the in the traditional manner of uh, efficient market hypothesis, right? And just like you said, there are a lot of a lot of points that that seemingly could even make it at times inefficient in a way, right? We cannot so much predict about that what the news outcome is going to be. It, statistically, from uh, from my best understanding, it kind of like is a little bit of a chance. Uh, related it's like a coin flip right it, and most of the time what it does is typically when the news comes out it's kind of like just chopping more it increases the volatility increases the risk without much uh you know interfere interfering you know into the actual trend right so what it does it just chops around more 
uh, increases the oscillations and then comes back to the previous values modes more often than not. Uh, now, I may be wrong about that. I'd love to, of course, hear, hear your take. Um, and just maybe, just maybe, uh, you have also heard of the adaptive market hypothesis that would state that we're not necessarily always efficient nor inefficient, that we are adaptive, that there are times and, and periods in the market where we tend to be more efficient, uh, higher up the rank, you know, in the, in the efficiency level, just like you mentioned. Uh, and there are times where we are fairly inefficient, right? How about all those insider training, you know, like the Congress people would have in the States, uh, some insider information. So is, is it is it really efficient just out of curiosity or to what extent it is efficient? Maybe it's adaptive. What do you think? It's, it's interesting. I believe in the adaptive because markets aren't efficient and that's otherwise you wouldn't have such things as bubbles. So I don't believe in uh, entirely in market efficiency and actually inefficiencies in the market actually provide us and these efficient inefficiencies can be identified especially using ai um, and you've got for example arbitrage is effectively pricing inefficiencies so inefficiencies provide opportunities for traders so again it's all about awareness and when you and identifying these inefficiencies and that's effectively kind of what you're doing when you're trading is identifying those inefficiencies and jumping on the bandwagon before anybody else does and that's why we got hft trading you know high frequency trading years back where the quicker you know that your server was you know if it's located on the on actual trading floor you could actually get the you know the pricing before anybody else and you could arbitrage against people elsewhere who, who had the pricing later and that was excuse me that was basically guaranteed profit for people that's in that's actually market inefficiency um but yeah with bubbles there's definitely inefficiency and we've seen that with emerging markets like cryptocurrencies there's a great deal of inefficiency and that's why there's a great deal of opportunity. So this is why I love trading cryptocurrency. Most of my, I started off trading stocks in the early days, in the 80s. Um, you know, I had up and down, but, but I did okay with it. I then went on to trading FX, um, which is a great asset to trade. But what I really love is the volatility of crypto because there's more and more inefficiencies there to be able to take advantage of. So there's more opportunity and that's why i absolutely love trading cryptocurrency the only thing is with crypto you need to be i believe you need to be able to trade long and short because i don't believe in just necessarily buying an asset and huddling it and sitting on it forever unless for example you might believe in the long-term future of bitcoin you might have might have done that but obviously if you bought at 68,000, um you're hurting for a long long time so if you bought early on, then maybe you do want to huddle it forever. But in terms of huddling, I actually like identifying assets which um, may be out of favor, may have really been hit hard. So there's a few of those assets around right now that have been downgraded perhaps by, by eBay and you know that they're, they're really in the doldrums right now. They're the ones that I don't mind throwing a small amount of money at. I just stick them in my bottom drawer and hold them and hold them and hold them. They're not ones that I trade, they're ones that's like when people got into Bitcoin in the early days, some people got in at a few cents on Bitcoin or a few dollars on Bitcoin and they held on to them. And now even at, you know, 24,000, 25,000, they're very, very wealthy because of it. So we have some opportunities like that. We can't always be sure which one, like in the early days of Bitcoin. I know people who got in um, when it was a few cents. And if, it, if I got in at a few cents, I just sold it when it got to a dollar. And I'd have sold it when it got to $10 and $100 and $1,000. I couldn't have held it all that way. Some people did. So that's why now I don't mind getting a few of these, what I see as kind of undervalued cryptos with potential. They might actually come to nothing. But if you get a few of them, under, undervalued cryptos with potential, stick them in the bottom drawer. But when it comes to actual trading, I prefer, personally, I prefer tokens which have real good liquidity. And you can identify, as you say, inefficiencies. That's what trading is all about, identifying inefficiencies. And these are the two ways that I like to make money um, by looking at the long-term hodling with undervalued ones and then looking at trading for them, my day-to-day -day, um, day -day price appreciation, really. That makes sense. And it, of course, uh, I think it encourages so many people um, to understand within our audience, you know, what 
what power, what an incredible power rests in uh, utilizing the AI ratings, right? And while it may not necessarily probably directly be used as a buy and sell signal, it still provides predictive value. It still is informative. Uh, perhaps maybe, you know, maybe incorporated in, in designing the trading systems, right? Just like you said, perhaps say, setting and deciding the regime or the direction of a trade. So that if, if, if the rating is positive, you know, and, and forward looking positive, maybe, it's going to be uh, probably better to align the trade direction uh, in the direction of the rating in a way. Isn't that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So we are actually building a directional indicator as well, which will help people. So at the moment, we have upgrades, we have downgrades. Um, but actually, even the upgrades work better in an up market and the downgrades work better in a down market. So we're actually building a directional indicator which we'll be rolling out along with a fully upgraded AI system again, probably within a couple of months. So what we have now, you might, you know, a lot of people think is good. What we're going to have is going to be absolutely amazing. And this will empower people with the directional indicator. And um, yeah, I think that's really what that will make. That is a real game changer for people. Very good. And while we have everybody listening and tuning into this episode of the Nest Show podcast with Matthew Vixen, please make sure if you're watching that on YouTube, hit a subscribe button, smash the notification bells also that you stay notified every time we produce new content just like this incredible masterpiece with Matthew Vixen. And while you're at it, make sure you jump onto his Twitter account at MDTrade. Make sure you follow Matthew Dixon, COFA. Uh, MD trade that's his handle incredible value already shared with uh, so many of you throughout our ep podcast episode and there is so much more that you can learn each and every single day I've been uh, following Matthew and, and actually watching you know his content for a long time already big fan of his works kindly recommend it hit the subscribe button uh, on YouTube and follow Matthew Dixon that is a little bit of a call to action that you cannot miss you should not miss if you love uh, predictive uh, value yeah. coming from incredible ratings, just in Matthew's shares. And the parts about in what's coming to the EVA is basically the next point that I had in my mind. So if you sp if you were to spill a little bit of beans right there and spill a little bit of tea, tell us, Matthew, uh, what are what is the pipeline? What is coming for EVA in the following months? Okay. Well, just just to just to sort of um, dial back a little bit, I wanted to touch on because I, what, one thing you said a, a few moments ago that you wouldn't necessarily use it, use it as a buy-sell signal. But we have actually really proven, I think, the, the validity of the trading, I mean, over a couple of the crises that we've had. So for example, with Luna, we actually upgraded Luna before the big rise in the Luna token. And then we actually downgraded in the week before it had the maximum. So that was actually the maximum upgrade possible before the big pump. And it's about 240% pump in the Luna token. And then we actually downgraded it in the week before by the maximum downgrade possible. So you could have used that. If you'd been using that on Luna, you'd have made your 240% and you'd have used the maximum downgrade signal as a sell signal to get out. And also with the FTT token, we actually downgraded that twice in the week before the crash in FTT. And we the, the signal was actually flashing up um, a red risk warning basically saying there's a big risk there there's also there's some divergent signals again between price and some of the oscillators so these are things again you're not looking at everything as a manual trader but you've got you've got a machine effectively looking at it for you and it flashed up these signals you could have got you could have got out of ftt before the big fall um, we've had numerous pumps indicated by the ratings and also downgrades before the uh, before falls in them so you know it is powerful, it is, it is worth using. Um, with what's coming up in the future, we're going to be, we're constantly analyzing what other data we can add to it. So the situation is that um, the more data you can add within an AI system, the more powerful it becomes. And it can actually sift the data and determine which data isn't useful, which data is useful. We can, it can look for skewed data. So, um, you know, things which basically aren't going to be useful um, toward, towards identifying value and ident uh, predictive value. So within a couple of months, we're adding some, some factors into the ratings, which will make it m more powerful by a factor. I'm talking about by a real, maybe a factor of 10 or something. It's going to be amazingly more, more powerful. 
um, are more predictive. And the big thing is, as I said, we're looking at a directional indicator, which will give you a much better indication of when to be going long in the market, when to be going short in the market. So as I said, when you're looking at, um, if you're looking at a directional indicator with the market in general going down, and this is looking really at world financial markets, because as I said, crypto is just another asset class that is driven by the vagaries of the market, by not only you know economic and macroeconomic issues, but also by um, geopolitical issues. So again, when you're monitoring sentiment and you can factor that into a system, these aren't things where you have to make the decision yourself. You've actually got systems which can monitor all of the, the whispers going on around the world about what's happening in Russia, Ukraine, in the Middle East with Israel, with Iran, wherever it might be. You know, a, a computer, a fully sort of cognizant AI system can actually take all this information into account. And it will, as I say, become more and more powerful because that's what it is. It's a learning system, artificially intelligent learning system, which is a deep learning um, system, which is, as I say, it wasn't possible years ago, but now with computing power so much more powerful, we can take full advantage of that and, and deliver this to people. And we're not, what's coming in the future as well, we're actually not just going to stick with crypto. Crypto's was actually a really good training ground because it's one of the most volatile asset classes. It's difficult to predict crypto. So the fact that we're doing that and we're going to get better at it is great. But we're also able to utilize this technology in other asset classes. You know, we can look at um, FX. We can look at potentially at, at equities. We can look even at properties. We can You can actually use ratings for virtually everything in life. If you've got the system, built the engine, and what we're doing is built a very powerful engine and you can use that in, in, in various ways, you know, and that's what we're doing. We're actually pivoting the technology. Um, the other thing we're doing is with, the, with eBay, we're going to build much more utility into, into what we're doing just to make it useful to everybody who's involved with the eBay business. Mm, very good, Rondon. And just like that, maybe, maybe Vai, who knows, maybe Vai is going to help us understand about your hobbies, Matthew. What are your hobbies? <laughs> Um, my hobby is actually, I'm, a, I'm an athlete from a young age and I was quite a good athlete in my young days. I actually got injured too much, unfortunately. Um, I've had about a dozen, well not a dozen, I've had at least half a dozen uh, cartilage operations on my knees, but I'm still running at my old, my old age now as a master's athlete. So for me, it's about, I love being competitive and this is even business is such a challenge, a constant challenge. It's like a hurdles race to me. You're keep encountering challenges and challenges and challenges and being competitive. I like to keep going and overcoming those challenges. That's what gives me satisfaction. But with age comes a bit of a mellowing. I also like to help people as well. So it's not just about being the first and being the best and whatever. I do actually like to try and bring people along for the ride and you know for the enjoyment. And I'm a very positive person. I love life. Um, you know, helping people just gives you so much satisfaction, far more than just helping yourself. So that's why we're doing, that's what, one of the reasons, one of the motivations behind eBay. We've got an amazing team and we're very, very close. And then, um, you know, everything we do is about helping, empowering people. It, you know, it gives us the satisfaction, but we can be competitive as well. So, you know, hopefully again, all those things dovetail together to, to um, produce something good. Makes sense. Makes sense. I fully subscribe to this actual approach, right? I love your 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 positivity. I admire your being actively open minded. That is something that has definitely led you here to being a very successful manager and CEO for Eve. And that is that a question that ratings based on AI, based on machine learning, based on deep intelligence and big data that increases over the time actually helps us make better choices, makes us less noisy, makes us less biased eventually because we have those good benchmarks to rely on. I fully subscribe and understand that. And I'm also looking forward uh, to, well, investigating on my own uh, for how Eve develops over the, co uh, over the coming months. And Matthew, before we close off, I, uh, we, will always have, we will always have this, this custom where our incredible guests uh, have the golden tip time so we can share this one great golden tip takeaway that you think that our uh, great audience and listeners uh, should take from this episode 
Um, <laughs> I mean, as a golden tip, I'll, you know, I, I actually, it doesn't sound much of a tip, but you need to keep things simple um, in terms of trading. Uh, it is a golden tip, actually, about, I'm just saying, follow me. Everyone says, follow me. I mean, for example, if you tune in to yesterday's market watch, we posted this market watch before the news came out. But because of the power of what we have, the predictive power of what we have, we basically knew what was going to happen with prices. So we knew that it was going to be a downturn yesterday. I mean, I, I do a lot of Elliott Wave analysis, but we're beginning to, I now have an automated system for Elliott Wave that we're factoring in with the ratings as well. So we basically knew what was going to happen in advance and we posted it and gave advice. I traded on it. Um, you, you won't believe this. Most people won't believe it, but I will prove it one day and post my trade record. Um, the last 200 trades, I've not had a losing trade. I don't hold trades for long. Um, my, my, you know, I, it's, it's an unbelievable record. It's, it's just ridiculous, to be honest. But this is the power of AI and 40 years worth of experience. And I'm looking to pass this on to people. So we are doing a trading course. We're actually working with a company called Mass, uh, Mass Adoption Academy. We're offering a trading course, which I genuinely believe this will make a difference to people. I'm not actually in it to make money. Um, Mass Adoption Academy, they're a training company. And I think it's important to have that professional framework to, to put this training. I'm not a trainer. I am a trader and the CEO of a company. I'm not, a tra I'm not a trainer, really. So it's good that we have that framework within, you know, to, to, to deliver this training. But I genuinely believe that this training will make a difference to people because 98% of people, again, come back to this, 98% of people lose money trading. We can actually turn that around, hopefully, that 98% of people could be making money trading if they follow some simple lessons that we can deliver. As well as follow MD Trade on Twitter, also Eve uh, underscore IO. So make sure everybody before we wrap this show that you head over to the Twitter of Matty Dixon, CEO Eve uh, at MD Trade, as well as Eve uh, underscore IO. Those are the most recommended accounts that you should follow on Twitter. This is my personal opinion. Uh, however, I do have a good backup to confirm that what I'm saying is true. Please make sure you give yourself uh, the sleep of faith and see what Matthew does with uh, with Yvay. Um, this is definitely totally recommended. And this has been a great, great time spent with you, Matthew. Uh, well, understanding and investigating deeper into the world of AI and how it uh, can be incorporated on the theoretical, academic, scientific, and also practical side to boost and empower people's trading. This has been Matthew Dixon talking to you as our excellent guest yeah. to the next to this excellent um, excellent episode of the Nestor podcast. Thank you so much. For, I, guess, for I just want to say, Adrian, I just want to say that I didn't really know you until until we met. You are one of the most level headed and professional people I've met in the crypto industry. And it's really heartwarming to have met somebody like yourself who actually has real substance. And I, I actually quite understand why you've got such an amazing following. You've got an amazing following with the, your, your community. And as I say, you are a unique person. And I think what you offer is absolutely amazing. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, it really has been a pleasure. And I, you know, I, I'd love to engage with you and your community going forward because you are a special, um, special person. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I'm terrible at accepting compliments. So I'll just say so that I hope that at least I inspire some of my audience to flood in your Twitter account. Again, MD Trade. This is uh, Matthew breaking, about to break 10,000 followers. Let's help him do it, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Nestor Podcast. God bless you. See you on the next one. Bye bye.